I think it was the summer I was 19, the first summer that I worked at Girl Scout camp, where I had grown up spending a week a summer or two weeks a summer, that I noticed when we drove down the driveway, there was a long driveway into the camp, with the windows open, there was this smell. And it wasn't just the smell of trees. It wasn't just the smell of Ohio. It wasn't just the smell of rain or whatever it was. It was the smell of camp, specifically. And after a couple years away, between my counselor and training year and my first year on staff, I remember realizing this smells like home. In some ways, it felt like the most home that I had felt since coming home from college, because coming home from college is only sort of coming home, right? Um, or coming home from moving away the first time in whatever way. It's still home, and yet it's somehow different than it was when you lived there all the time. But camp still smelled and felt like camp, even just driving in. It brought back all the memories of the first time that I went to overnight camp and was away from family for more than a night at a time. The first year that I camped in platform tents in the unit closest to the dining hall, farthest from everything else, but apparently they thought the littlest kids particularly needed to be close to meals. <laughs> of the mossy bricks and damp wood on the porches of the houses that became the sort of the, the staff hangout on, for break time. Even now, when that camp has closed and is now a park instead, if I drive down the driveway with the windows open, it still smells right. I wonder what smells have that kind of power for you? What kind of smells evoke that kind of memory in you? It might be as overwhelmingly positive as the smell of camp is for me. It might be something far less positive. Certainly, I think if any of us were to land at a trash dump, we would find the smell to be powerful if not pleasant. <laughs> but smell is just a powerful trigger for all sorts of things. Studies have shown us that we don't just think that or feel that, that really our brains are doing something. When we smell something, that it is the most powerful of our senses in bringing up memory. I can't even imagine how powerful the smell must have been in that house in Bethany that night, after an entire pound of pure nard perfume was poured out over Jesus' feet. Let's go, go ahead and assume that this is a house built to let air through in a desert climate. Still, that much perfume. I saw somebody on a reflection blog compare it to taking an entire wine bottle of perfume and pouring it out all at once. And this oil of nard is not a neutral scent. This is a scent that is particularly associated with anointing for burial. And so to add in, in this house where it's very possible that the last burial for which they anointed a body what was that of their brother and friend Lazarus, who was then raised from the dead. This is the same family, the same house in which Mary now anoints Jesus' feet and wipes them with her own hair. So, of course, historically, the church has chosen to focus in this story on what Jesus does a couple chapters later, rather than talk about Mary 
pouring out perfume over somebody's feet and wiping it with her hair. Now, of course, this story is important in that regard. This story of Mary wiping Jesus' feet with her hair foreshadows the way that just a couple of chapters later, Jesus will wash the feet of his friends in a similar friends dinner party kind of setting. That's, and that story is important enough that we're going to spend an entire week walking through it with extra services. We're going to start next Sunday with special service on Palm Sunday, pray for it not to be raining so that we can start outside with our palms and shout Hosanna and remember that Jesus came into Jerusalem as part of a protest movement against Caesar's empire of death and came in in triumph and then we'll turn our attention to the story of his passion. And then on Monday, Thursday, we'll come together in the cafeteria and we'll have a small enough group, we, we think, because it'll be a midweek service that we will have our masks down for part of the service to be able to share a simple meal together. And that meal will be filled with the prayers of, of Holy Communion, of the Eucharist woven into it, the way they might have been for Jesus and his friends at that last supper. We will have an opportunity to wash each other's feet. We will have the opportunity for joy together in sort of a one last time kind of feeling before we then turn and become more solemn and those of us who can stay past 7 or 7.30 at night can process down to the library for a more solemn ending and listen to the story of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane and sit in the garden with Jesus for a moment. I hope you'll sign up for that service. I think it's going to be a really special experience, and we do want to have somewhere in the range of the right amount of food, so it would be great to know how many folks are coming. And on Friday, we will come, and we'll start in here, and instead of the space set up the way you see it now, we will have stations of the cross, stations of Jesus' journey to the cross, that are set up around the space, some of which will be, the images will be um, coloring pages colored by some of our kids and families, some of which will be images created by some of you. And we'll walk from station to station with a wooden cross, with some prayers, looking at these images that folks have created to reflect this journey that Jesus takes We'll process again down to the library. Those for whom an hour is as much church as they can church are welcome to leave. Those who want to church a little more or have joined us just for that part, for the more seated part, are welcome to stay then for sermon and Good Friday offering, which is a, this is the hundredth year that the Episcopal Church will be collecting offerings on Good Friday to support the work of the Anglican Church in the Holy Land. And then we will follow that with the traditional solemn prayers of Good Friday. And we will remember through that whole walking journey and that more seated journey, that part will be live streamed, how Jesus got to the cross, why Jesus got to the cross, why it's, sometimes not, why it's not what we sometimes tip toward thinking is the reason that he got to the cross. And then we'll come together two weeks from today on Easter. And we will have walked that journey with Jesus, and so we will be truly ready to rejoice with him in his resurrection, in Easter worship, with amazing music. And if you want to bring bells for the Alleluia's, bring some bells, and we'll have a cross for kids and really anyone else who wants to, to help put flowers in. And we'll just have so much joy and our joy will be more complete for having walked that whole journey with Jesus together. That whole story is important. And the way that this story leads us there is important, both in John's gospel in the structure and for us in our faith. And yet, I don't want us to just jump there too fast. 
I don't want us to get distracted the way that Judas does with all the other things that are also true in this moment with Mary. And I do want to say on Judas's behalf that there is no reason historically for us to think that Judas was a thief and that Judas was stealing the money out of the common purse. This one line is the only witness we have to that. And we have every reason to think that it had to do with the ways that Christians who had not, were not Jewish were beginning to turn against Jewish Christians and Jewish non-Christians. And it is at the root of some of our Christian anti-Semitism. And so I encourage you to just sort of set that line aside about Judas. Let the rest of Judas's story be enough for Judas to carry. <laughs> but today I want us to sit next to Mary and to feel and to act and to smell and to wonder and to mourn and to notice how sensual and transgressive and also how welcome this act is. I want to say that again, that this act is sensual and transgressive and also welcome. And all three of those are important in why this story, in Mark, Jesus says, this woman will be remembered forever because of this moment. All three of those pieces matter. It matters that we see this moment, first of all, that this is welcome, right? This would not be a positive story if Jesus had not welcomed this touch. Unwelcome touch is not a positive story. Not then, not now. If somebody says, no, please don't touch my feet, let alone cover them with oil and put your hair on them, then we don't touch their feet. <laughs> but Jesus welcomes it. And it seems, reading a little bit into the story, as if, there is a relationship built to the place where Mary had reason to believe that Jesus would welcome this. Would welcome this touch that is a sensual act to, an, to anoint people in a, you know, with a little oil on the thumb and putting it on the forehead is not necessarily a sensual act, right? It's a, it's a tactile act. But the anoint, anointing that we do in a healing service or in baptism is not a sensual act. But to pour a pound of perfume on somebody's feet and wipe them with your hair is a sensual act. It's a full-bodied act. And it is an act that goes beyond the boundaries of what would have been considered expected. Presumably that's really what is at the heart of Judas's objection here is, this is not what we do. We don't just w walk up to our guests and pour perfume on their feet. And, and yes, it was expensive too, but, but what and why am I watching this? And yet, thank God that we did get to see this. That this did happen, not behind closed doors, where it was private, but where enough people could witness it that we get the story of it today. The best work that I have seen in scholarship around this story comes from communities that are not afraid of things that are sensual and transgressive and also welcome. The best work that I have seen around this story comes from communities of LGBTQ plus readers who are used to saying this is done truly in love and this is welcome and yet the world says that this is out of the bounds of what should happen. The world says that this is transgressive, that this crosses a boundary. It's not the boundary that we have set and consented to within this relationship and so it is still a good and loving thing no matter what the world has said about it. That kind of practice changes the perspective with which we read scripture or anything. And so something has developed that may be familiar to some of you and new to many more of you, I would guess, which is queer theology. And I want to take a minute to unpack that term a little bit. 
because I know for many people, the word queer in and of itself still feels like an insult or a word that we're not supposed to say. The word queer is itself transgressive to many people, um, which is on purpose, that that's a word that the LGBTQ community has reclaimed, and we've said, this has been thrown at us, but now we're gonna pick it up and put it on for ourselves and own the ways that we are transgressive, that we do set our own standards, and love is the first and foremost of those standards. And so queer theory has developed in analyzing queerness, and queer theology has developed out of queer theory. And so in this context, the term queer has a few different flavors that I want to um, put out there to get to as common understanding. One is within this conversation that queer does get used as an umbrella term for LGBTQIA folks and communities and perspectives. And within the conversation in which that is considered a positive thing in queer theory, in queer theology, then that's a welcome use of that word. So I want to make sure that we all understand that boundary of within the context in which it is positive, then it becomes a positive word. And in this conversation, it specifically often is used to refer to action that is transgressive, that pushes outside of what we've always done, and particularly how we've always thought, that turns things upside down and says, what happens if we look at it this way? And sometimes says, let's put that right side up and put that right back on the shelf where it was. That did not work out upside down. And sometimes says, oh, oh my, that's beautiful. Let's leave that right there. And then the third is as erasing some of the boundaries, not all boundaries, but saying what are the boundaries we would draw if we didn't already have these, bo these boundaries set? If there were no boundaries, what would the boundaries of love be? What are the boundaries look like when it's not how do we draw a boundary to contain love, but what boundaries would love draw? So I wanted to sort of lay that out as a foundation for what it means to read scripture and do queer theology, to have that basis that is a shared understanding. And one of the, there are a number of things. We could spend hours on this story from a queer reading, and I promise I'm not going to do that. Um, but one of the readings in this story that I want to particularly highlight today from a queer reading of this story is that when you come at it from this perspective, one of the things that you might notice is that what Judas does in this story is to try to push a forced binary choice. Either this money goes to this perfume on Jesus' feet, or this money goes toward the poor. And that means that either we are extravagantly expressing this love for Jesus, or we can take care of the poor. And therefore, we must take care of the poor, and we must not do this thing that with which I am not comfortable, because I can set it up as a forced choice against taking care of the poor. And what I want to invite us to hear in Jesus' response is not, don't worry about the poor, they'll always be there. And not a command to always have poor among us in the sense of make sure that, no, that, that you never get to a place where nobody's poor. That is not the command of Jesus. But to say, yeah, why not both? Why not pour out all we have for one another in love in as many ways as we can find to do this. What if I told you that you could give lavishly today and give lavishly tomorrow? Not because 
you have to be wealthy to do that, but because there will always be something to give. There will always be something in you to give. Because you yourself, and not just the money you bring, are gift. You yourself have gift to share. And so Jesus rejects that forced binary choice and says, I see a different way to go about this. And I think you can too, if you let yourself. Usually at this church, we focus really on being the church that serves and the sense of the church that does a bunch of stuff to help people, the church that in many ways follows in Martha's footsteps. This is the same Mary and Martha about whom we get the story in Luke about uh, Martha doing all the things and Mary sitting at Jesus' feet and Martha not being super happy that her sister has left her to do the work. This is a Martha kind of church. And that's a good and holy thing. There is nothing about being the church that serves that we would want to give up or change. But I think today, Jesus is inviting us to say, don't let that get set against just sitting at my feet and loving lavishly and letting yourself be loved lavishly. Don't let that get set against taking time to be deeply with me and with this story. That you can go deep, you can receive deeply, you can be loved deeply, and that will give you more in the end for the work of being the church that serves. I think this positioning at this point in the season of Lent, of this gospel, invites us to take a breath and for the next two weeks really focus on walking into this story with Jesus, letting it be our story too, finding ourselves in this story, finding a place where this story speaks to us of the love that is ours to receive and the love that is ours to pour out, even in ways that surprise us wildly and maybe even make us the good kind of uncomfortable. In both these stories, Mary is criticized for not being more practical, and in both these stories, Jesus says, actually, that's a good choice too. Sometimes a little impracticality is what's called for. So I invite us to try on Mary's choice in these next two weeks. To take the chance of spending a little more time, a little more focus on this story than we often do the rest of the year, and to see what comes out of that for each of us and for all of us. Amen.